uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The pentastron was made of these things called ear 91s. Though there were earlier ones of this sort, uh, an exemplar of this kind used a power amplifier was a PX4. Well, again, about the filament. The, uh, the, the, the filament is, the, is signified by this line, sometimes with a curly bit here to indicate it heats up. It heats the cathode. It's an element for heating the cathode embedded like in an electric light bulb in a, in a normally, you know, evacuate, evacuated vacuum tube uh, valve, uh, as they call it in the primitive parts of the world in the United Kingdom. And um, grid is a, is a controlling element which modulates the stream of such things. And the anode is a kept a relatively positive potential. It has a thing called load resistance attached to it. What's that? It is a resistive impedance. What does that mean? It means it has a resistive component of impedance which consists in a component which is inductive, capacitive, and resistive. This is cheaply resistive. You will have a, an output for AC amplification, alternating current amplification, which is a capacitor, which you may regard as a very initial copy of the signal coming in here, and received it over a resistance R dashed, which is very much like an R dashed dashed. Which is about the same as, let's say, greater or equal to, let's say, about the same as. Uh, and you may put, of course, a, a capacitor in there. So you can amplify an alternating current signal to a circuit, which is a very satisfactory amplifier. It essentially works on voltage, whereas a transistor works on current. And this miraculous invention called Barrett. The other thing I was mentioning, apart from the screen grid, which is this one here, has a screen around the grid, has a second grid in it, and the pentad, which has a second modulating grid, apart from the first, is what I used to make a pentastron, which is now called a phase locked oscillator and transistor technology, so I believe in particular chipper technology. However, I give an example of this, the F91, which was a, a modern type. Machinery, available even to the early 60s in, in production quantity. They made many artifacts out of it. The, uh, What's so good about phantastrons? Well, because they, they, they do essentially this phase lock thing to say a couple of, you have a couple of two times one mega cycle os oscillators, crystal, or crystal oscillators. You want to count down to give a continuous pulse to a PPI radar arbitrarily, these will divide by an integral number you choose. And you do it essentially by introducing one signal onto there, one signal onto there, locking the phase of the signals, controlling all this. And you can, if necessary, introduce another here. You can have a circuit called cathode follow, which is the same thing as an emitter follow, essentially. I will draw it in the case of this one, which is essentially no. It's not a pentode, this is a, no, it's a no, diode, it's, it's one of this one, this is a, this is a, a, a triode. Yeah. triode. A diode would be obviously that, I mean, I've drawn it, there it is, and it's a diode. Well, it has a, sorry, it has a filament in it too. But uh, if it's a vacuum diode, and actually diodes like crystals and so on, and, uh, cat's whiskers before that, but um, solid state devices. We also had uh, the, the Cahira, another very complex solid state device which has never been achieved in the mod tech of comp side. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, but the mod uh, tech the, um, the mod tech tech of comp side, side. exactly. Well, the Pentastron was in fact a very much better device than the phase locked oscillator because it worked the side better and was produced in production quantities rather less expensively and it was used in every good MPPI radar set. And there must be thousands of the bloody things. What is the coherer? Well, the coherer is a piece of metallic oxide mixed with some various substances, which are commercial secrets, of course. But on the other hand, it's discovered by taking one apart. And they turn out to be a curious mixture of sort of cobalt and, and cadmium and zanadium, I think it is. No, sorry, not zanadium, vanadium oxide. Vanadium oxide. It's, 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 it's an oddy. 
and together with some things rather like getting carbon microfilms and carbon granules, but much smaller. Yes. How did it work? Well, it worked essentially by producing what it says coherence. It, it cohered, the particles in question cohered ah. together. Well, due to the application of radio waves to them. This was a receiver thing. It was part of a radio receiver. And you had a, also a magnetic amplifier. I mean, I go back now to the First World War, 1418, as against the one I'm talking about now with the radar set from 39 to 40, whatever it was. And uh, one had a device called a coherer, which, when it received a radio signal, would modulate DC current from the carrier wave. And it cohered it together. Wow. And this thing okay. was a very low transmission, about two KC filler cycle bandwidth. Wow. And I was talking mega cycles before. It was a detector that made it detected and spy coherence. That's right. Yeah. And the other, the other one possible, of course, was a diode and some sort of storage device. You had essentially. Mm. Mm. Essentially. Mm. essentially Tell me a little there. more about the coherer. This is a simpler form. Very capacitor coil. Uh, uh, element which has a resistor component, I get to regard as a diode and a variable resistor component here. Here you have coil. You needn't, I mean, this could just be a headphone, for example, you do this with a headphone. Okay. That would be a complete this antenna. Uh, this goes eventually to an earth. And it didn't go through anything if it was a sensitive enough device like a pair of headphones and signal is powerful enough. And this is a cat's whisker. In other words, it's crystal glina. That's to say lead sulfate and or silver wire. Very useful to know if they are stuck and to receive radio messages. As you can find galena in many places. It's a silverish looking mineral with a very typical uh, crystalline structure. You dig it out of the ground in many places where you don't expect to find it. And it's very useful because you take any sort of wire, it's just silver, it doesn't matter too much, and uh, sort of approach the surface of it at the right point. You have, happen to have a pair of headphones, it's very useful to carry. Uh, you need to have high impedance ones, by the way. Well, how do you? Well, I mean, I'm not laughing about it. It's all I've used that saved me life. The next time I take a DC 10, I'll make sure to bring my Walkman along just in case I need well, to I make mean, a Galena radio. No, I mean, I just need some. I'll have my headphones with me by coincidence. A perfectly good radio these days would consist in that. I mean, I could receive Let's any go back to the station computer. transmitting here. Let's go back the to the computer. It's a very simple thing. It's a device which consists of a certain rather arcane mixture of granules. Including vanadium oxide, including carbon granules, including various oxides of iron, and some of oddly enough cadmium, and I think it is also chromium. <laughs> and you think it doesn't have? Uh, yes, a few things. And what is the material? I mean, they vary in composition. It's a powdery form. It's yeah. rather like it looks rather like a, a scaled-down carbon microfilm. And I remember it well because Oliver Selfridge alluded to my earliest chemical computers as like the coherer. I thought it was extraordinarily conspicuous of him. He did so at Teddington, and the NPL is next door to the place where we consult, apparently, in, uh, in London. And uh, that's just next door to the MTA, 158. And in his uh, critique, his discussion, proper critique, I didn't mean nasty critique at all, uh, a paper had to do it. A demonstration, some demonstrations that had been given, and I had given, in fact, personally for the most part. Uh, he discussed the similarity between the coherer and the early chemical computers, in which I thought he was entirely correct, and indeed cited my father's very good friend Baird, and uh, the television guy. And uh, we discussed it at some length, and I recall the discussion well. We went out to dinner with Stafford Beer at the Mitre Hotel, which in those days was excellent. I had an excellent restaurant, and uh, delightful restaurant, and we all went out uh, to the Mitre at Stafford's expense for United Steel. How which the dates particles it. Cohere? Well, literally, they aligned themselves. It was like having magnetic domains. For example, I mean, the first. Uh, what you now call, I believe, a double <coughs> memorand. 
storage device was demonstrated in 1961, no, 60, at the Allison Park, as I think I've said before, by Chapel Bowman, who said, oddly enough, he'd bought a quart, which he was unlikely to do, by a quart of Boy Scout compasses. We didn't entirely understand what he meant until later, but it became more or less self-evident during his talk that he bought a large quantity of these things. And when he showed me later one of them, I think he showed one to the audience, but I was sitting a little bit at the back, so I could not easily see the magnitude of the apparatus. I didn't realize it was the entire apparatus. It was obviously it was anything about this size, to make it even that big, and he bought one quarter of them and put them together, so one of the HP fields he made by rotating a magnet on the top, and the other one he made by rotating a magnet in this direction, or so on the it, and by hand, or maybe I think one was by a fan of that sort, an electrical fan, and the other one was more or less, I guess, semi-synchronized by hand, and then he put an impulse into it and observed it spread through the Boy Scout campus and returned mm. to itself. That was the first book of memory, that's where Bell Telephone got the idea from. Mm. Who wants to know? And it's recorded in that book. Mm. ONR sponsored conference, Allison Park, 1962. The um, second major conference I attended in the USA as a, you know, major speaker. Mm. Full participant rather than. Junior, very junior. I was obviously still junior to most of the participants, but I and uh, indeed many of them they taught an enormous amount. And uh, but I, at that stage, the second one where I sort of upgraded to the status of a speaker, presenter, rather than being simply a student only. I uh, sort of upgraded that. What did you have to put across the coherer to get it to cohere? You put a radio frequency wave across it, and it demodulated essentially into so that you could pass through a current almost. Pass through a DC current here. And this is RF. And this is a audio frequency modulation on the RF, so you've got a wave here, which is like this. This is the image represent. Um see what's called in this diagram. This is the ADSR part. Long the F wave which is the audio wave. I call it ADSR in deference to a diagram of the synthesizer. And this is the carrier wave. And that's perhaps, um, I don't know how many, it could be anything from 100, uh, 100 kC upwards, and in droid which transmits about 200 kC, it's a no long wave station. This is the thing coming over the radio. That's the radio, that's the radio wave. This is that's the, the modulation way envelope. Modulated. That's the modulation envelope of the audio wave, and this thing extracts. This this essentially polarizes this thing, sets it in the DC a certain here orientation. Polarizes yeah. It. Yeah. Uh, no, the DC does not polarize. DC right. is passed through as alternating current. I don't get that. And extract as uh, well, it, it, it divides, amplifies also. You extract it from this, this component from here, passed the component from there, taking it out to some device which has a resistive component in it chiefly. So I draw it as a resistive component to ground. Okay. It goes from battery, signified thus, to ground. That goes from antenna to ground. Where's the other end of the battery? Sorry, put the wrong place. Apologize. That's it. It goes to there. That thing goes to there, the plate inside. And that's just the antenna. The antenna is on here. Okay, that's fine. a radio receiver with an amplifying component. Now, the other component, signified here in part, is called a magnetic amplifier. And it consists in a sort of super auto transformer, where you have a control winding which essentially modulates the saturation of the core. And that was used in the trenches, the telephone systems. So you have a saturable magnetic core, and a larger unsaturable magnetic core which I guess I'll signify this way, with its own winding around it, okay? 
You have a takeoff coil from this one. That's an amplifying device. I have to put it here. It's an amplifying device. It's not associated, it's not meant to be associated with that circuit at all. You know, can draw it in different pre up. Keep them separate. So it's sort of an auto transform. It's a modulable auto transform. There's the modulating coil on the thing, and it's modulable because this part of the core, which has the secondary winding on it, and not the modulation winding, which is here, is obviously modulating this flux. So you have further. I'll draw a little thing more clearly. Draw it in a different color. The diode and an AC generator. Some so, and some headphones there. So if you want to soup up your headphones, which could perfectly well be there, with a resistor component down to ground, you put them there. How does it work? <coughs> it really works by saturating and desaturating a part of the core, the AN core, yeah. of the transformer by a modulation winding. When the core is done, they saturate anyhow. But you put in a modulating AC current, so the core where it works with mm -hmm. transformer, and taking off with another winding. They were used for stage dimmers. I mean, when I was on the scene, that was the most recent stage dimmer how available. How does the component fit into the, the whole thing? Well, it's an amplifier. Okay. And it's the, the only the proper amplifier. The, the coherer is different. That I've drawn different color. Yeah, how does and this fit into the coherer? It doesn't necessarily. I mean, these are different different types of equipment used. In I see. This is used in this time. It's an alternative type of reception. Right. When they can be combined, I suppose, in some sense. Where are the DBs and the PBs going? Sorry? DBs and PBs are not really relevant to this discussion. This is a historical discussion. What you call analog electronics, I think. But if it is a coherer, and if it does zinga zinga when it finds its coherence point, it does. It is made to cohere by the passage of this high frequency current through it. You have a tuned circuit, obviously. Yeah, but case, it's yeah. a detector fundamentally. Do I understand you to that? That's correct, yeah. So, But it has a semi-amplifying property, whereas this one does not really. Oh, it's I simply a diode-like property which filters out the audio frequency component envelope out of the... Let me draw that in, again, black or something. Here is a... Think of black pin, the audio frequency envelope from the radio frequency wave, okay, which you would refer to as ADSR, if you correctly. And of course, it's symmetric about sine wave. And, it? um, sir? I'm sorry. The uh, an amplitude modulation system, all of them. Work. This whole thing, ADFR in relation to, to the port of. Voice well, that's a different matter. That is a different issue, much more recent. You're asking about, first of all, I know, first I'm, radios, I'm, first I'm TVs, and so on. And, and we then went on to the first, what you call, bubble memories. You, present, uh, oh. I'm sorry, somebody has. Now you're saying that they, they are called in the magazine, I'm sorry. They're called in the comp side magazine. I wouldn't agree with you. Would you're saying time. that they cohere in the Maybe same way. memories. A very similar in uh, three dimensions to that thing in one. And the first one I saw displayed was it in 1960. And the man's name was Ben. Friedman. Yeah, and he was at Allison Park under the sponsorship of the ONR for Heisman first. <laughs> All for the University at that stage of Illinois as I was. Would that be in the VCL? Um, it should be, but it will be certainly it is published in a separate <laughs> volume. I have it. And I think it is published in 62 by Pergamon Press. I think what you'll find in there are some papers referred to that volume. And it's called, I believe, The Principles of Self Organization, or it could be known as Principles of Self Organization. And it's edited by, it is edited specifically by. Uh, some, somebody in Zopf, Z-O-P-F, George Zopf, who has the dignity of inventing that special NCR special paper on which you can make illegibly typed messages copied. He invented it? 
Uh, no, he, he invented it actually. He invented the memory, the storage, you know, thing, the, the device for replicating what was like carbon paper. So let's say that I had a bubble domain memory that didn't work. Make the main memory that didn't, didn't work. I mean, much better. How would I? Uh, you make an interesting device that this character Bowman was suggesting. Unfortunately, he was killed in a car crash. How would I put something? Um, what? How would I put something into it? Or I don't know. It depends how it was irregular. What do you mean, put something into it anyhow? What do you want to put into it? You mean something to be memorized or something to be stored? Memorized. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. We could do it almost anyway. But it would depend a little bit, I guess, upon where the thing was in its BH characteristics. BH? Yes, and the magnetic characteristics. Streets and B force. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Well, you essentially have a couple of fields operating on such a thing. And you have an injection field operating on such a thing. Now, the present idea is to make them into four loops. Where things go around from an input gate with minor loops attached to them. So they're copying essentially what you can find much better done in Paul Weston's program cylinders. That, that's all it is. I mean, and he's done it well, much more elaborately. Much. It's not that much anywhere near, actually. But I mean, that would be the maximum you could achieve for the device if it works properly. You take its BH curve. and offset it from the optimal region. For example, in that direction, which a lot of them turn out to be. And different, of course, in doing that direction, which is also interesting, or various skew directions, and some that can't easily be described in applying this. Silly. You a batch like that, and depending on the type of batch, a slightly more detailed examination of the characteristic. I mean, in this region, the things are not allowed to propagate domains. They're not allowed to annihilate domains. And they can't duplicate domains. So they're prohibited from having any interesting properties. And they are behaving essentially as trivial forms of cylinders by Paul Weston under Hansel Fisk at the Biological Computer Laboratory cases of being with Fogg Ben Chance. I will give the acknowledgments. Thank you. And they. In that area, they certainly can do no more, and I doubt they can do as much as a fairly standard Du Bois playing what Paul Weston couldn't with a fairly standard computer, which came up to the Act 4 in the end or something, but I mean, it was nothing much of a computer. The Act 3, I think, was the climax of that thing, and I believe he used it. Thing designed by uh, Bruce Comic. Uh, isn't it? I mean, it's much in advance still, actually, of these pipeline processes and those goddamn vector processes, so called. <coughs> but um, I think Paul probably had access to that, so maybe I'm underrating cylinders a little bit. And um, I don't really know what he did with at least four independent of 255, more or less independent. Processes eventually. Because unfortunately, he too uh, picked out a different disease, a different disaster. And I'm quite sure of that actually. He certainly got very badly hospitalized, and I think picked out. I really don't like to ask his lady. So I don't know if he was alive, he would find out. And didn't even like to ask mine, he knew quite well. She's had so many agonies of her own over some. Andy dying and so on, the rest of it. Johnny, sorry, dying. Andy being ill. Which I really don't like to ask him. But at any rate, if you take it out that domain, you get a device where you get replicating bubbles, you get reproductive bubbles, you get all sorts of things like bubble domains, uh, propagating various directions and so forth, and you can do all kinds of things with it. I mean, it's a wonderful device. We can't get this fellow Berman to come back and wave his hands. Uh, no, I mean, there's no need. I can just get a quart of compasses. I mean, we need a quart of Boy Scout compasses exactly. to demonstrate the principle. Yeah. Well, he did it in front of her. I saw it. I mean, it's very easy. You can see the wave propagating as you could in my machine. My chemical computers, you can see propagating wave. 
I'll make one here yeah, with pleasure. Fabulous. All I need is a freezer, a tank, and uh, some man wire. And then if you want a more elaborate version, you do a passivation of a different kind. You do a passivation cycle, and it'll grow, evolve. Do any damn thing you like. It's much better than all those contraptions and bloody boxes, keyboards, and tell us about keyboards. And keyboards are fine for keyboards. Those things are fine for dealing with keyboards. Teaching the little images of symbols you need something more powerful than that contraption. I'm not so attuned to accountants and bookkeeping and the like, in which it is. Standard statistics and the rest of it. And all great and baloney, you know it perfectly well. Historical development of things, historical ossification. It is. I know it if you don't, I think you do. You ought to. Beautiful idea, come down the drain. Ends up with a bleeding apple. Which in turn ends up with a sort of carapace containing the remnants of what used to be an apple is now replaced by a Z80 processor and a special processor to immobilize the original one, and a few other processors to immobilize everything but the power supply, I think, and the case. I intend to invent a technological breakthrough, something to destroy the case. <laughs> or anti the case, annul mm -hmm. the case. Uh, that might be better. Mm, it probably wouldn't be more prudent, but it would be better. We should have some doubt. It wouldn't be prudent. Um, well, I think it would be prudent. We'd probably leave it in the case, but I can make a case annihilator, which will somehow extend the capacity of the thing by extending its fundamental bars. And I'm sure I can manufacture a chip which does that with enough ingenuity. I meant to be really good at coding, that's why I was employed during the Second World War. And. Um, rather than simply being a schoolboy, which is probably true. And um, those stupid things are so primitive, I mean, uh, so narrow, uh, blinkered visions of what could be done with that technology. Uh, it's absurd. It's truly absurd, I mean, it's such a limited, sort of restricted view. of what possibilities, what potentialities are of that uh, very lovely technology. And the history of magnetic domain memories, bubble memories, as they're called, is, uh, they could be magnetic domain memories, they are bubble storage. They're diluted into standard form. Or, um, uh, even better cases, but in some sense they're a different kind of technology slightly. And uh, it would be um, very easy to convert them to much more elaborate kind. And you know, by having a 3D Euclidean array, you can't really do anything more than elaborate accountancy, frankly. I mean, you can do the, the graph theory, put diagram. Mm, well, it's useful only. It's not really helpful because you want infinite number and you want different topologies of computation altogether. Uh, these stupid things become immediately infinite in a real sense rather than imaginary sense, sort of Turing sense, imaginary sense. If you, they become really infinite rather than sort of infinite tape infinite, imaginary infinite theoretically infinite, uh, they become practically infinite, so you try to do anything interesting on them. Which doesn't accord with a very simple-minded kind of arithmetic, frankly, or mathematics, or algebra, if you like. Very simple, one of the million-fold algebras in existence. You try and handle a non-commutative algebra possibly on this thing, properly. Even possibly. Well, it's not possible on that thing which has, I know, three discs, three mini discs attached to it. There used to be two of them, now one's disappeared. And apparently they can even be linked together. Great, a technical breakthrough. 
country that it wasn't possible. It took a day and a half, one and a half man days, to link bloody things together, both pretty expensive man days. Ridiculous. It took about four hours. Well, all right. Half man day. Bloody expensive. Certainly very expensive. I, I take your right. estimate against mine, which, is, uh, which was 12, but I mean, maybe four. We don't really have the I don't know. I mean, if I have to cost it somehow, according to the standard that contraption allows me to compute. You know why it didn't work? I haven't been that. It was probably loose plug. No, I think the <laughs> version of the program we have is above version. Well, it could be. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I, I mean, mentioned it to Helen on the phone. Mm. Said, no, that sounds like the version we used to have. It was wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, um, as I was saying today to both you and Geoffrey earlier, that Geoffrey knew earlier, and which I should say first, G comes from B balls or Geoffrey ball. Uh, I guess is the correct order. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of alphabetic ordering, lexicographic ordering, one. Uh, should I suppose say that, and uh, it struck me it took a bit longer, and it also struck me that the, the transportability problem was ridiculous. I mean, if I can bring that thing, which I, I thought would be, you know, have a monitor or something attached to it, which was integral to the contraption, perhaps, and I, I declined initially to take it. I frankly cannot manage this. It'd better be packed in a case, and uh, Bobby said, you're being stupid. Well, I said, look, Bobby, I'm not, you know, I really have this bad bag. It's not a joke. It's, it is a problem, and uh, it is difficult to get porters, and it's difficult for me to arrive. I'm better getting up to the airport uh, and get a mini cab. Surely I shall do anyhow. And I can take it in that, and I can get a driver who will take it a certain way, but I can't get it through the customs the other end. There's no way I can do it, Bobby. He said, Don't be so stupid, God. This thing is not heavy. And I said, All right, well, what is it? And he showed me this thing. I was very surprised, as a matter of fact. When I look at the cards it contains, which are quite numerous and so on, and they could be more densely packed without increasing the rate. You know, the weight a great deal, it would just be a fairly reasonable thing to put in my suitcase. And, um, okay, I mean, I can either be carried or the customs guy can carry it across customs. Or else I'll refuse to get through customs or something, which will embarrass the airline, in which case I'll carry it. And the, um, it turned out, actually, the guy didn't want to inspect anything in that particular bag, but at any rate, it was perfectly carryable, and that is as transportable as anything else. You could pack the whole of your so-called software, which appears to be a great pain in the neck to transport, um, and make it into a perfectly, you know, compatible form for, I guess, any machine, more or less, inside that box by removing the keyboard which is the heaviest part. It has no power supply in that, I understand. Um, no, they put it. Sir? Have to get yeah, the power supply, I think, is outside that yes, casket, and uh, well, it must be, because it's not, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate to have a 230 volt 50 cycle power supply. I'll um, sleep late in the morning. Mm -hmm. And if you could tidy, you, we have eight open beer cans here. Oh, uh, tidy everything up. Uh, I always tidy things up for you. You, you have been, and I appreciate that. Uh, I ask again. Yeah. Really? Wasn't it you do that? I do it automatically. It's not something I wish to. Well, in this story, I tidy the Jeffrey's waste paper basket. You throw them into the lobby. Like I do know. normally, but if necessary, I will throw them into Jeffrey's. She doesn't mind, actually. Well. She has no objection. I have an arrangement for <laughs> that she doesn't mind this event. Uh, this occurrence is not offensive to her. Especially if I can cover it with it a piece of paper which yes, is uh, discarded. Well, it help the room. No, no, I appreciate it's better to put them into bangles. Well, I wish we had a database scheme, but I'm not too worried. A database scheme is what? I mean, uh, what do you want? I mean, we have a database scheme. Well, that's really what you're not thinking about anymore. 
database scheme or something that can be implemented without thinking anymore. It's not, it's not something which is that. I wanted to have that as one of its properties. Get it? You would like a uh, representation inside some sort of machinery of um, perhaps information to include what is called a database, at least in outline. Am I correct? Exactly. Well, I think that's possible, yes. Um, it was very simple to include a relational database as a sort of cover in acting sense. For example. Just do it, Gordon, don't talk that. Well. Just do well, it. we were discussing earlier, I have done it in a couple of applications, I've done something that involved a scheme, not a complete product. It's nowhere near an algorithm. No, it's not. It's a scheme. You ask for a scheme. If you want an algorithm, I will probably produce one. Um, I've been asking for an algorithm for months. But you've been asking for an algorithm very much more complicated than a database. Give me. You yeah. have been asking for an algorithm to execute something like, say, Give me a way to move. cast or what? You've taken your microphone off. Well, I have no definition. I don't know you want to have that. Well, at any rate, I have to stick the phone on there. It's very just like the space man. Yeah, ten years from now, Gordon, when there's information that we think we want we'll to like extract, we can do it by a hmm? non-correlative technique in which we extract the noise of H Street from the tape by auto coherers. Well, sure, you, they're not coherers. Are not. I mean, I need to caution you, Paul. This coherer mentioned here, yeah. Anna Oliver Selfridge, is the immediate reference. I recall them well. My father had one, and compared it with one of those. Yes. And all of those can join one of those. And one of these and one of those. Yes. Uh -huh. One of these amplifying devices is a, an alternative, and he preferred this one for immediate perception. Since the day for radio stations. Meaning there's in England he was an Isle of Man. I still don't know what the uh, detection The detection is simply that the coherence curves and you get a, essentially a series of diodes. This becomes a series of diodes okay. at some part. I gotcha. So it demodulates. I see the modulation goes mm, away. Yeah. And it, it demodulates does. essentially. It becomes a series of diodes. So it, it will allow At you to smooth the waves of DC waveform. Yeah. Well, it's not a single stable state. That's and determined by the tuning coil. In fact, you determine it with the tuning coil and this mixed uh, impedance it has partly a resistive, partly a capacitive, and partly an inductive component. But you have a tuning circuit, nevertheless, which obviously tunes the thing otherwise to the particular um, amplitude modulated frequency band to which you're listening. It has its own resonant bands inside it, as indeed the theratron does. Draw the theratron as an additional aid in the wire. And it's normally signified by a thing like this, which uh, that's the anode, that's grid, that's the cathode. It does or does not, depending on the make, need a heater tube and filament. I'd say it does, it usually does not, actually. It may be crossed out, so I signify this with two X's here. That is the trigger signal, which has to be of a fairly high impedance. And this control is, for example, one of, one of the things of um, So the first stage demos I knew used to control that coil with a thing like this. Okay. And it frequently blew up. There is a plasma tube which is triggered on 50 cycles or 50 hertz AC and would control several kilowatts of AC power. And that thing is called a theratron. C bad. So I guess I couldn't vouch for it. He was father's friend really rather than mine. So a good deal older than me, Frank Paul. 
But I remember him well, a very nice guy. Uh, he did the theory of them. Another character called Puckle, uh, who used to work for, well, used to generalize, as it were, for a while as well. And I think they before that magazine, which had a similar name. And they wrote this book, which is still in my library. I puckle with numerous references to band, which explicitly states in plots synchronizing bands for this nonlinear device here, Barotron. And I have brought them to your attention. You should observe them perhaps more closely. The book was originally made in 1922. It was revised in 1927, I believe. You see, no, well, you can just look for a book by Puckle. which I believe is called Time Bases. That is to say, the sort of generators for early television sets based upon the then novel principle, not the flying spot disk scanner, but the cathedra tube. And it was the line and frame scan, which was determined by different frequencies of sawtooth oscillator. And these have the remarkable uh, property, of course, of producing an appropriate modulation, a waveform of this kind, which, which you can introduce pretty easily, an interpolation for synchronizing purposes over this signal here, occasionally, that's kind of. hmm? That's how you put your line and frame sync pulses in. That was an enormous advance, revolutionary. In fact, it made the whole of TV possible in the modern sense of the word, and probably been made possible elsewhere. Other ways of doing it, more like the modern techniques, actually. And one of them was very really similar with another plasma device. Um, I was so demonstrated to Liverpool, and to just a very large number of electrons in a plasma tube, which was quite flat. I don't take and draw it as um, the electrodes first. It's cool. They were like this, uh, just uh, very numerous electrodes embedded in this evacuated envelope, filled with a gas. Semi-evacuated, low-pressure gas, uh, made to plasma. Usually there was a, a field across it. And these were modulating. So a signal came along here. In 1932, I think is the first <coughs> very definite recall I have of the apparatus. They are optional. They'll put them plus minus, plus minus. You needn't be there. So to have to activate the plasma somehow. And plus minus are meant to alternate. Obviously. I'll put sine and cos. Um, these are the activating electrodes. This was what is now called, I believe, a. Um, a liquid crystal display, because it yeah. was done in plasma. It was a flat TV tube. Okay. And those are the activating electrodes. They were, came before the cathode ray tube, a device like this. It's a spout here. And reflecting guns in here, or coils, whichever you prefer. Mm -hmm. And the luminescent screen here, and the cathode here. Some new tissue. And an anode here, and the projection of the stream, focusing beam, etc. I in fact developed long before then. And this was the first color TV that I recall ever seeing. And it was only seen in a commercial exhibit near the Fruit Exchange, in fact, in Liverpool. 
At least I only saw it there. I'm sure it was exhibited in London as well. Um, uh, Strawn is the name of the faith box oscillator, which was in those days used when it used the EF91, a pente valve, as the most economic component. It was great, more economic than using current technology, I think, but I'm not sure. sure. 